Hello everyone. It's a great pleasure for me and Jay to receive the Ludwig von Solomon Prize from ICER. And we would like to thank the Scientific Selection Committee for choosing us. Today, we're going to tell you about a solution to the worldwide myopia epidemic. And this is a tale of translation from bench to clinic. We do have disclosures. Jay and I invented eyeglasses for the prevention of myopia that are currently for sale in Canada, and they are approved for sale in the European Union, and we receive royalties and licensing fees. More exciting for us, we co-founded a company to take the eyeglasses to the present stage of commercialization, and it was recently acquired by a joint venture between Cooper Companies and Essilor Luxottica, and these are two of the global leaders in the myopia prevention market and they're working together to accelerate the commercialization of our eyeglasses to combat the global myopia epidemic, which currently affects about 2.6 billion people worldwide. Myopia is the leading cause of visual impairment in children. Over time, it contributes to an increased risk of developing permanent vision impairment, including macular degeneration, retinal detachment, cataract, and glaucoma. Common juvenile onset myopia is caused by over elongation of the eye. How that works is illustrated here. Each data point is a measurement of the corneal curvature on the Y axis versus axial length on the X axis for adult emetropes. So these are people who have no refractive error. There's tremendous variability in the optical power of the eye and this is mostly due to differences in corneal curvature as you see from the spread on the Y axis. Eyes with more curved corneas, like here, have shorter focal lengths, and eyes with flatter corneas have longer focal lengths. Young children have eyes that are too short for the optics, and they are far-sighted so that the image comes to focus behind the retina, as illustrated here. And during normal development, the eye is guided by visual information to grow in the axial direction, stopping when the axial length is well matched to the optics such that the image is optimally focused on the retina. Both of these drawings are of emetropic eyes. They just differ in both corneal curvature, thus optical power and axial length. Here, we've superimposed data from myopes onto the emetrope data. The variability in corneal curvature among myopes, which are the circles, uh, and among emetropes, which are the diamonds, is similar. However, the myopes have longer axial lengths, as can be seen by the spread of data along the x-axis. So we have two questions. First, why is growth controlled so perfectly in some children so they grow up to have perfect vision, while in others the eyes fail to stop growing when they should, leading to myopia? The second question is why has both the prevalence and severity of myopia escalated to epidemic proportions? Modern environmental factors associated with increased emphasis on academic success, use of video screens, increasing urbanization, and less outdoor activity have been attributed to the dramatic increase in myopia, but we don't know why. We got interested in this when Terry Young and colleagues published this paper in 2004 describing X-linked high myopia associated with cone dysfunction. This is a very severe inherited form of myopia in which affected individuals often have refractive errors more, more than minus 12 diopters, and they frequently go blind from complications caused by their excessively long eyes. Genetic linkage was used to map the locus for uh, Terry Young's patients to XQ28, and the locus was officially named MYP1 for the first myopia gene. XQ28 is also home to the L and M cone photopigment genes, and Jay and I have spent most of our careers studying red-green color vision and sequencing the XQ28 cone photopigment genes in people. So we knew that the nucleotide sequences of these genes are highly variable, making them an ideal candidate as the genetic cause of a common inherited vision disorder, such as myopia. It also turns out that the red and green cones mediate high acuity vision, making them excellent candidates for playing a role in visually guided regulation of axial growth of the eye, which goes uh, runs amok during myopia. 
This is the sequence of exon 3 of the L and M cone photopigment genes. There are eight dimorphic nucleotide positions which are given in red. Two of them are silent. The others encode amino acid differences, which are specified here by the single letter amino acid code. So we sequence the L and M opsin genes from uh, the patients in the Terry Young uh, report and found that all of the affected individuals had an L or M opsin gene that encoded the same unusual combination of amino acids in exon 3, and that was LVAVA. The fact that the LVAVA haplotype causes uh, inherited severe high myopia has now been confirmed by multiple labs worldwide and estimates of the mean spherical equivalent refraction for males with the LVAVA variant range from minus 10.8 to minus 13.4 diopters. The molecular mechanism for how the LVAVA haplotype causes a problem with photoreceptor function was elucidated by Uyama's group who demonstrated that the haplotype causes exon 3 skipping. They did this using a minigene splicing assay, which is a well-established assay in the splicing world. The minigene is basically the opsin cDNA with the introns 2 and 3 inserted, as well as different variants of exon 3. The minigene is transfected into HEC293 cells, and then the uh, splicing isoforms that are uh, generated are examined by sequencing, and they found two major isoforms. One is the normal isoform in which exon 3 is included, and the other one is one in which exon 3 was skipped. We have gone on to develop a quantitative version of this assay uh, using the Agena Mass Array genotyping platform that uses a primer extension assay and analyzes the products using Molotov mass spectrometry so that we can get ratios of the peaks of the different ones and have a very quantitative assessment of the different splicing isoforms. Using this assay, we established that 86% of the messenger RNA generated from the LVAVA haplotype lacks exon 3, compared to 0% of the messenger RNA from the control LVAIS photopigment gene lacking exon 3. Eukaryotic genes typically have both exons and introns. The whole thing is transcribed into messenger RNA, and then the splicing uh, proteins, the spliceosomal complex, binds to the exon-intron junctions, and within exons there are sequences that participate in splicing. So I've drawn here an example of an exonic splice enhancer that can recruit auxiliary proteins that interacts with the spliceosomal complex to promote the recognition of exon B and the inclusion of exon B in the mature messenger RNA, so that then exon A is spliced to exon B, is spliced to exon C, and this encodes the mature polypeptide. If the exonic splice enhancer is disrupted or altered to create, it, as I've drawn here, it, an exonic splice, in, uh, an exonic splice silencer, the splicing machinery uh, may fail to recognize exon B and fail to incorporate it into the mature messenger RNA, so that then exon B here is skipped. And in the case of the photopigments, when exon three is skipped, a functional photopigment is not made. So what I've told you so far is that MYP1 is the X chromosome cone opsin gene locus. The mutation causes a defect in splicing of the cone photopigment genes, and it produces cones with a dramatically reduced amount of photopigment compared to neighboring cones expressing normal variants. So our next question was, do any of the individual single nucleotide polymorphisms have a significant effect on exon 3 splicing, and then by extension, on the common juvenile onset form of myopia. To get at this, we created 128 different mini genes. Each had a unique combination of the exon 3 polymorphisms. And then we measured exon 3 skipping in our quantitative mini gene assay, and we did this in duplicate. And then we did a Criswell's Wallace uh, non parametric test to compare the median percent exon 3 for all variants with X versus all variants with Y at each of the dimorphic positions. And the results of that assay are shown here. So this is the sequence of, of exon 3, and here are the amino acids at each position. We labeled them 1 and 2. These are the SNP IDs, then the nucleotides at allele 1 and 2, the percent exon 3 skipping for uh, allele 1 and 2. And then here, these are the Bonferroni corrected p-values. So we corrected for multiple comparisons. And we found three different positions. The nucleotide polymorphism in codon 180, 
in codon 178 and in codon 171 are all having a significant effect on exon 3 splicing. And so for our next analysis, we focused on the one in codon 178 because this particular nucleotide polymorphism has a nearly 13-fold effect on exon 3 skipping with uh, 13 times as much skipping for variants with G versus those with, with A. So the question is, is the distribution of spherical equivalent refraction different in people with A versus G at the codon 178 SNP, which has this ID number? So we did this by looking at human subjects, and we had a variety of inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, notably, they all had to have normal color vision. They had to, um, and they were unselected for refractive error. We sequenced their L and M opsin genes. And then in the final analysis, we only included males who had a single L opsin gene and who had no new or rare L or M opsin gene sequences. We performed a man whitney u non-parametric test and found an effect size of 2.12 diopters. That is the median spherical equivalent refraction for people with G versus A at this codon 178 polymorphism differed by 2.12 diopters. And this was highly statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.005. This is the largest effect size so far identified for myopia. The largest effect size before this was found using genome-wide association studies, and the largest effect size was 0.15 diopters compared to our 2.12 uh, diopters for the conopsin genes. So now the question is, are haplotypes of the l opsin gene associated with juvenile onset myopia? So we had a data set from 413 males that represented 11 different haplotypes, and we did a split halves analysis to get the rank and order of the severity of mean spherical equivalent refraction. In the split halves analysis, we randomized the subjects to two groups. We ranked each group according to their average spherical equivalent refraction for the 11 different haplotypes, and then we repeated this a thousand times. The correlation between ranks of the two halves is an indicator of the amount of variance in spherical equivalent refraction explained by opsin gene haplotype. And here are the results of the split halves analysis. We've plotted this mean, <laughs> the mean spherical or equivalent refractive error for each subject against the haplotype rank. And uh, so these are the split half, these are the data from the two halves. The correlation is extremely high with an R squared of 0.98, and the probability this correlation could have come about by chance is 4.51 times 10 to the minus 9. The mean refractive error is highly correlated with the haplotype rank, and the different haplotype rank scores serve as predictors of a person's risk of myopia. We did validate our split halves analysis by using the same data set, except that we randomly scrambled the assignments of the subjects to haplotype groups, and this did not result in a significant correlation uh, at all. So here we plotted the split halves data showing the mean spherical equivalent uh, refraction in diopters versus the photopigment gene haplotype. And you can see that the photopigment gene mutations are associated with a range of refractive errors, and this reflects a range of genetic dispositions for becoming myopic. The association between myopia and polymorphisms in the photopigment genes accounts for 7.5% of variance in refractive error. This is almost twice as much as previously discovered myopian genes combined. Our discovery that mutations in the cone photopigment genes are the major source of genetic risk for myopia has led us to an unconventional theory of myopia, which Jay is going to tell you about now. Hello, everyone. Jay here with the second half of our presentation. I just want to echo Maureen's sentiment that we feel deeply honored to have been chosen for this award. And we're really happy to be able to have this opportunity to tell you our myopia story. This is a microscopic image of the human cone mosaic with its red, green, and blue cones. The patients with high myopia always expressed the defective gene in either the red cones or the green cones. And the defective gene causes the cones expressing it to be very inefficient in absorbing light. What this means is that there's always very high contrast between the normal cones and their neighbors 
that express the mutant pigment. Our red and green cones work together to give us black and white vision. So, if we ignore which cones are red and which are green, the pattern of activity across the retina would look like this illustration, where light dots are normal cones and the dark dots are mutant ones. Thus, the mutations in the cone photopigment genes were responsible for producing a constant level of contrast across the retina, even when actual images on the retina had little or no contrast. It was extremely surprising that this was the cause of extremely pathological high myopia, and that this same contrast effect is the major genetic contributor to common school-age myopia. Our new hypothesis is that over time, contrast on the retina stimulates the eye to grow. And abnormally high retinal contrast signals cause the eye to grow excessively, leading to myopia. We call this the contrast hypothesis of myopia. This hypothesis provides a potential answer to the question. Why does normal growth fail in some children but not others? The potential answer is that gene mutations that cause abnormally high signaling in contrast pathways contribute to an abnormal rate of growth starting in early childhood. This predisposes some children more than others to myopia. So the next question becomes, how do we explain why our eyes would have evolved so that retinal contrast signals the eye to grow in length? According to our theory, the explanation is simple. Young eyes are farsighted, which means literally that they can see far away things clearly. This means that in natural scenes, such as this forest, the images of scenery in the distance that fill a young person's vision will be sharply focused and they will have high contrast. Thus, when the retina is filled with high contrast images most of the time, it's an indication that the eye is farsighted. Next, let's consider the condition of the eye in a young adult who has grown up to have perfect vision. Eyes of a young, normal adult bring images of distant objects into perfect focus on the back of the eye. If the eye is focused in the distance, images of nearby objects, such as a person, come to focus behind the eye. When we shift our gaze to interact with the nearby person, the eye accommodates, adjusting its focus to make a clear image of the person on the back of the eye. However, whenever we focus at near, images of faraway scenery that fill our retina are out of focus and they're smeared out at the back of the eye, producing relatively low contrast. But what about young farsighted eyes? The unaccommodated adult eye brings faraway images to perfect focus. In comparison, for the unaccommodated young hyperopic eye, images are brought to focus behind the retina. However, the young eye can accommodate to bring faraway scenery that fills a retina into perfect focus. Importantly, when the hyperopic eye accommodates to focus on a nearby person the same amount as a young adult would, two things happen because the eye is too short. One, images of nearby objects come to focus slightly behind the eye, and they are not quite as clear as they would be for an adult. Two, images of distant scenery that fill the retina come to focus in front of the eye, but not as much as they do for a young adult eye. Thus, whenever a child is accommodating, which is most of the time, distant scenes that fill the child's vision are in better focus and higher contrast than for the adult. According to our theory, it's this change in focus from far-sightedness to normal vision 
or distant scenery that fills vision goes out of focus for the accommodated eye and loses contrast that stops the signal for the eye to grow when it's no longer farsighted and the person ends up with perfect vision. To look at it another way, when we are accommodated, it is this change in contrast in distant scenery that fills our vision that occurs when a child goes from being farsighted to having normal vision that stops the contrast signal when perfect vision is achieved. Let me show you that one more time, okay? Here's farsighted, and here's the change to normal vision. This brings us to question number two. Why has both the prevalence and severity of myopia escalated to epidemic proportions? For our prehistoric ancestors living outdoors, when the eye was accommodated to seeing things clearly with foveal vision, the things they were focused on, like the face of someone they're interacting with, filled only a tiny part of their central vision. This means that when a person has normal vision and is not farsighted, the distant scenery that fills most of their vision is out of focus, producing low contrast in their peripheral retina. This is an image of a screen from a MacBook Pro viewed from a normal viewing distance. The yellow circles are the exact same eccentricities as from the last slide. You can see that unlike the natural world, when a child has a screen in front of her face, not only a central vision that she's accommodated to in perfect focus, all of peripheral vision is also in perfect focus. In the natural world, objects in peripheral vision are far away. And if they're in focus, it means that you must be farsighted and the contrast in the periphery drives the eye to grow. So why has both the prevalence and severity of myopia escalated in the modern world? It's a combination of stimulation of contrast pathways by our genetic makeup and by exposure to myopic stimuli, such as computers and tablets, that determine how myopic you are. So how do we prevent myopia? We reasoned that if we could reduce peripheral contrast, it would reduce the signals for eye growth and prevent myopia. Something like this. This predicted that if we could make glasses that reduce peripheral contrast, it could be a solution to myopia. We did the following experiment. We recruited 14 children between the ages of 7 and 11 who had fast progressing myopia. We had them wear glasses where one lens was the standard of care and the other lens was designed to reduce contrast as illustrated here. Here are the results. The experiment was carried out over three months, shown on the x-axis, and we monitored eye length, shown on the y-axis. As you can see from the black line, which is the average for all the children, the eyes with the normal lens grew at a constant rate. However, growth was greatly slowed for the eyes wearing the low contrast lens. All the thinner colored lines are measurements for individual children. Here are the same results shown another way. This just shows the huge difference in the rate of eye growth over the entire three months where the low contrast lens virtually stopped eye growth compared to the normal lens. This early prototype eventually led to the development of the commercial sight glass dot lenses shown here. The lenses incorporate light scattering centers that lower contrast. They also have a clear aperture centered on the pupils. The image on the right was taken using lighting conditions that make the light scattering more visible. But the children on the left are wearing the spectacles and the spectacles are very well tolerated. These glasses are currently the subject of a North America wide randomized controlled multi-center clinical trial. The clinical trial has been negotiated with the FDA to have a duration of three years. It is just now completing its second year. We anticipate FDA approval within the year. However, already based on the one-year data, which I'm going to show you next, the spectacles have been approved as medical devices, clinically proven to slow the progression of myopia. Here are the details of the ongoing clinical trial, which is called Cyprus. 
It is being carried out in 14 sites in North America. We enrolled 256 nearsighted 6 to 10 year olds. There are three arms, two different therapeutic test patterns and a control, which is the standard of care. It's a three year study with planned analyses after one and two years. I'm going to show you the results after one year and we will have the two year results within the month. 286 subjects were screened. 265 subjects were randomized into one of three groups. In the end, 256 subjects were to spend spectacles. At one year, 234 subjects were ongoing. One lens pattern worked better than the other, and that pattern is the one that's been incorporated into the commercial product. To keep things simple, I'm just going to show you the results for the better of the two patterns. The results are remarkably similar to the ones that I showed you for the original proof of concept within subject study. These results are for spherical equivalent refractive error. The myopia of subjects in the control group progressed on average 0.54 diopters in the first year of the study. However, the subjects wearing the treatment spectacles progressed on average only 0.14 diopters Thus, the treatment spectacles produced a 74% reduction in myopia progression. People with mild myopia are not in much danger of losing vision as a consequence of their refractive errors. However, as Morning told you, patients with high myopia are more likely to suffer diseases that threaten their vision, such as glaucoma and retina-related disorders, such as retinal detachment and central retinal degeneration. At the present rate of increase in prevalence and severity of myopia, it's been projected that will be nearly 1 billion high myopes on Earth who are at risk of losing vision by 2050. If we can get children at an early age into spectacles that reduce myopia progression by 74%, there is the potential to completely eliminate high myopia and the associated threat of blindness. We feel that this story we've told you today is a wonderful example of the power of the scientific method. We made a series of new discoveries that led us to formulate a hypothesis to answer the question, what is the underlying mechanism that causes myopia? The hypothesis predicted that lenses that reduce contrast would slow the progression of myopia. And experiments to test that hypothesis have produced results that support the hypothesis. While we may be in the position to eliminate high myopia, the current technology cannot eliminate myopia completely. However, we hope that further application of the same scientific approach will allow us to refine the technology, including better methods to identify children at risk for myopia and even more effective treatments. Thank you for your attention. I want to acknowledge the people whose work is responsible for us winning this award. First, our current lab members, the whole Sight Glass Vision team, and our funding sources. And none of the science that's come out of our laboratory over the years would have been possible without all, all the amazing people that have worked in our lab over the years.